Hi, Michael. How are you? Excellent. It's good to see you. Uh, nice to see you as well. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. I wanted to just start off from like your background. Uh, tell me about your journey and in working into uh, what you're working on. A synthetic biologist. It's not something I'm like. I'm based in Dubai. Not a lot. I don't meet a lot of synthetic biologists. So what is it that you do? Let's go from like ground zero. Ground zero. Uh, well, uh, my original background was in computer science. Uh, I have uh, two undergrad degrees in computer science and biology. Um, I then uh, got a PhD in uh, uh, genetics, uh, mostly developmental biology, and did post uh, postdoctoral training in cell biology. Um, I, I'm many things. I don't know if if uh, synthetic biology is you know kind of the central one. I'm I'm fundamentally interested in uh, um, computation, information processing, and cognition in various uh, the diverse embodiments. So I'm interested in how cells, tissues, molecular networks, swarms, colonies, how they solve problems, and uh, these problems can be in behavioral space, in transcriptional space, in anatomical space, and, and, and physiological space, and so on. So my group does a lot of work with embryos, a lot of work with uh, synthetic uh, living machines, uh, all to try to understand how intelligence scales up from the competencies of uh, cells and subcellular components to those of whole creatures. And so what is bioelectricity, and how does that like play into the work that you do? Well, uh, if you think about, uh, for example, uh, embryogenesis, right? So, so individual cells are very good at managing individual cell level goals. So, so metabolic states, uh, physiological states, and so on. But during multicellular development, what they have to do is work together to form some kind of large scale functional anatomical structure. And if they're interfered with, so for example, if an early embryo is divided in half or if a regenerative animal is then uh, injured later on, the cells have to cooperate to do new things to rebuild that shape. So they have this ability to work towards a specific outcome from different starting positions despite different uh, perturbations and so on. So we have to ask ourselves, how do cells cooperate and signal to each other to en enable them to work towards these large scale goals? And <clears throat> we have to ask how the system as a collective intelligence, because that's really what this is, it's a kind of collective intelligence that solves problems. We have to ask ourselves uh, how these collective intelligences store memories of what it is that they're supposed to build. And it turns out, and we've been working on this for many years, that uh, much like the cells in your brain work together as a collective intelligence to uh, provide an emergent self, an individual that will solve behavioral and other kinds of problems. The cells in your body use those same kind of uh, mechanisms, so electrical connections with each other in networks to process information, to make decisions and to store memories. And bioelectricity or developmental bioelectricity is the name we give to that whole set of electrical communications between cells. And then who decides the large scale goals, the outcomes? Like, okay, I know like a group of cells working towards a goal, but out of all of these cells, out of this collective intelligence that we have, where, where does the decision making uh, like, you know, uh, process happen? Well, the decision making is, is, is exactly a collective process. So, so there is no one cell that makes decisions and then tells everybody else what to do. That's generally not how this works. Um, the field of collective intelligence studies how the behavior of individual subunits, which have local policies about what they're going to do, ends up determining the policy of a large collective. So this this is how you know people study the, the navigation in fish flocks and uh, termite colonies. They build you know it's the, it's it's basically the exact same question of who decides what a what a termite nest looks like. No no individual termite has the the whole structure. So these uh, these electrical patterns that are built uh, by the cells are. Uh, the pattern memories that emerge from the electrical activity of the uh, hardware that these cells have, which is basically ion channels and electrical synapses known as gap junctions. And like any electric circuit, once you turn on the juice, it has certain properties uh, that it, it, it makes certain patterns. It can, some of them can do computation, some of them store memories. These particular electrical circuits have been shaped by evolution in a way that when they are active, so this is real-time physiology, when they're active in, in cells, they... Um, begin to drive patterns that are uh, so, uh, that are interpreted by other cells as directions as far as what to do. So cell division, cell migration, proliferation, apoptosis, those things. So, so evolution shapes the hardware and physiology is basically the software of the system.
So how does one set of cells create one organism over the other? And this memory, uh, uh, like pattern behavior memory uh, from one is different from the other. Like who, uh, like how did this evolve? Like I know evolution does play a big role, but like why does it like uh, a snake evolve into a, a frog? What's the, uh, like what's the dividing mechanism? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because um you actually can make cells with one particular genome, meaning one particular species, create a body that looks completely different. And we see this, there, there, are, there are many examples of this. So uh, one example in, is uh, something that we've done, which is to take uh, flatworms with a very specific type of head and uh, perturb the bioelectric network in a way that they make heads that belong to the wrong species. So of, of, of plat flatworms, about 150 million years distant. You can also use the same thing to make um, flatworms that have two uh, permanent lines of flatworms that have two heads instead of one. Uh, this is not genetic. This is uh, because the circuits have a, a kind of inf memory. You can rewrite that. You can artificially rewrite that memory. Um, biology uses this all the time, this kind of uh, hacking. For example, if you look at galls, these amazing structures that form on plant leaves, uh, it's signals from the insect uh, or other parasite that uh, basically um, hijacks the building competency of these cells. And instead of a nice flat green leaf, you get this spiky round red looking thing. It's, it's quite, quite amazing. And so, so, so there is no guarantee of what these cells are going to build. They can in fact be induced but with new information. They can be induced to build other things. And we've made xenobots and, and other, other structures out of wild type cells. But what evolution does is that it produces hardware that normally left to its own devices reliably builds a particular pattern that induces cells to build a particular structure the ones that look like a snake we call it a snake the one that looks like a frog we call it a frog and so on so so there are many potential attractors in the state space of possible circuits and by the way you know bioelectricity doesn't do everything right so so it's a very important aspect but there are also biochemical signals biomechanical signals and all of these networks have stable attractors that we recognize as particular anatomies but in fact, you can shift them from one attractor to another using the appropriate signals. And this is also what we hope to do in regenerative medicine. The idea is to take a birth defect or some kind of uh, injury uh, uh, state or something, or, or, or in fact, a cancer and something uh, like that. And uh, the question is, what signals can we give those cells to get them to go to the region of morphous space that we like, to re that represents a, a, healthy, a healthy organ or an entire healthy body? Let's go back a bit. Can you explain a little bit more about the research that's done on these flatworms and these xenobots? Uh, to someone who doesn't understand the work that you do, how would you, uh, what, what, like what led to the paths that you've taken? What are the implications of the findings that you've had? Yeah, uh, well, the, the whole path is, is, basically, is basically this, that um, in order to, uh, to, to solve most of the problems of biomedicine, right? So, so most problems in medicine boil down to the control of shape. If, if we knew how to get cells to build what we wanted them to build, we would immediately have the answer to birth defects, to be able to regenerate from traumatic injury, to reprogram tumors into normal tissue, to re, uh, re reverse aging. All of this would be possible if we knew how to communicate uh, anatomical goals to a collection of cells. And so all of my work um, is, is and, and many other people's too, of course, is aimed towards understanding how the competencies of individual cells, because ind individual cells are very competent little creatures. We all used to be unicellular organisms a long time ago. And so, so how do the competencies of individual cells add up together into a large scale collective intelligence that reliably solves these kind of problems, the anatomical, physiological, and so on. If we understood that, we would first of all have many solutions to uh, biomedical problems. We would also have all sorts of uh, uh, robotics, both biological robotics and AI that's uh, generated uh, you know, via, via engineering. And, and we would have a much better understanding of evolution. So, so, so in, in other words, our origins, both the bodies and our minds, how we are, where they come from. So all, this whole, this whole uh, kind of line of inquiry, and this is why my lab does so, so many different things from, from artificial intelligence to birth defects to regeneration to cancer, because we are trying to understand fundamentally how minds scale from little tiny minds of cells that have very simple local goals to uh, the much larger ones that, that we and other creatures have. And so uh, in order to understand this, we have to 
use a variety of, of techniques from biophysics to computer modeling, molecular biology, and so on, to try to understand the mechanisms and the algorithms by which these things are solved. And so we use model systems. One of our model systems is planary. So these are these amazing flatworms that um, have many interesting properties. First of all, they're highly regenerative. So if you cut them into pieces, every piece knows exactly what a correct planarian looks like and regenerates everything that's missing. They so, are also so, sorry to interrupt you, but what is a planarian? I, like not everybody knows what that is. I know you, in your field sure. of work, people do not understand what's so unique about this. Well, a planarian is a flatworm. Uh, it's about a centimeter in size, let's say. It's a very flat uh, little little creature. Um, they are similar to our ancestors, so they're not like an earthworm. They're not primitive that way. They are. They have a true nervous system. They have a true brain. They have uh, eyes. They have digestive system. Um, and what's what's important about them is because they're telling us that several things are possible. First of all, they regenerate their entire body, including their brain. So they're telling us that it's possible to be an organism with many different uh, organs and be able to regenerate them as an adult throughout your lifespan. They're also telling us that it's possible to be immortal. So these ideas that uh, lifespan is limited because eventually errors accumulate and there's nothing you can do about it, this is clearly wrong because these planaria are basically immortal. They, they do not age, they don't have a lifespan limit um, so they're telling us that it's possible to be a complex uh, structured creature and, and never age. Uh, they are also smart, so they can learn. You can train them various things. And if you train them and cut off their heads, the tail will regrow a brand new head and they will still remember the original information, which is teaching us that information can be stored outside the brain. It can be moved through the body, imprinted on new brains, which tells us some very interesting things about what's going to happen when humans repair their brain with with new regenerative technologies. When you have new cells in your brain, what's going to happen to your memories, your personality, and so on. So these these kind of model systems have, have huge implications for both both, you know, sort of medical and fundamental. And uh, we uh, do experiments to try to understand how all these processes work. So one of the things that we try to uh, understand is when you cut a piece from a planarian, you cut a small fragment, uh, how does it know how many heads it's supposed to have and where the head should be? So we started uh, studying this, uh, this, this bioelectrical communication and uh, we, we uh, discovered that there is an electrical circuit in the cells that's if that uh, stores a pattern that a uh, pattern of voltage distributed among the cells and we can see this directly that we have this um, voltage sensitive fluorescent dye which is a chemical that you put on the cells and it glows in a certain way to tell you where where the, all the voltage gradients are and we were able to read the same way that people try to read memory from the brain or the way that uh, you might uh, read memory from a uh, from a computer circuit, you use techniques to read the electrical state or the physiological state, and you can try to decode that to see if you can understand what it says. And we were able to decode it to see what me what determines the fact that there's going to be one head and where it's going to be. So having done that, we developed then tools to rewrite that memory. And we don't use electromagnetic fields. There are no magnets. There are no waves. There's no electromagnetic radiation. We use the interface that the native interface that cells use to program each other, which is the electrical little, the little ion channels that are on the surface of every cell. So every cell has these little ion channel proteins in their surface, and those are the those are the um, that's the machinery that that sets the electrical properties of the cell. And each cell can signal to each other via its ion channels and via the gap junctions, the electrical synapses. So we developed some tools to manipulate that process, and we rewrote that pattern. And we said instead of one head, you should make two. And what we found is that when you cut those animals, in fact, the pieces make two, two heads. And these two heads are permanent, even though their genetics were not altered. We didn't do CRISPR. We didn't write the, rewrite the genome. Uh, it's the electric circuit that stores that information. And we were able to cut those worms. And <clears throat> in future rounds of cutting, they continue to be, to be two-headed. And we also found that if you perturb the circuit in a different way, then what you can do is you can make them create heads with different shapes. So if you do this to a planarian with a triangular shape with a with a certain kind of brain inside, you can get them to regrow flatheads or round heads that are appropriate to completely different species of planarian. So you're saying that gene splicing and editing wasn't done and even then there were like changes in the way like they developed, right? So what is the relationship between uh, pattern voltages and memories of how cells are cells grow and like their uh, what's it called uh, sorry if i'm like butchering this but then what their intentions are as like you know oh, this one's going to do this this one's going to do that 
Yeah. What happens is, right, the genome was not edited in any way. You have to remember that the genome does not actually code for anatomy. If you look at the genome, you don't see anything there about heads, eyes, the size of the animal. There's nothing directly in there like that. What the genome uh, uh, encodes is the protein level hardware. So it tells every cell what, what protein it, proteins it gets to have. And then the final result is the effects of the physiological software playing out in the, in the, tissues, in the tissues of the animal. So that, that physiological software generates uh, signals to all of the cells. And so you can think about it exactly like neuroscience. So, so in neuroscience, you have a bunch of cells in your brain which are electrically active and they process information, they store memories, and the result of all of this are electrical signals that control your muscles, and those muscles move you through three-dimensional space. That's that's what the nervous system does. Well, it, it all, all of that was evolved from a much simpler system that did something very, very similar. What the old version of that system did was have an electrical network that's not neurons, it's basically all cells, and they do the same thing. They process information, they send electrical signals to all of the cells. And instead of the muscles, it, it controls all of the cells. And instead of moving your body through three-dimensional space, what it does is it moves the configuration of your body through something called morphous space. Morphous space is kind of like this virtual space that's uh, every, it, it contains every possible anatomical configuration. So everything from a single cell egg all the way to an adult, everything in between, and the latent space of all the forms that could have been made, all the different types of faces and legs and arms and everything else. So the signaling of the bioelectrical network of the body tells individual cells what they should do in order to move correctly in that space, to move from the region that uh, is occupied by single cell eggs all the way through to the adult body, and the same thing during regeneration, cancer suppression, and so on. It's a navigation system. It's primarily, all, all of this is a kind of navigation in this uh, anatomical space. Is that the same as gap junction, or is that something different? It's very related. So gap junctions are electrical synapses. They're ways for two cells to connect electrically and pass uh, pass information to each other. And so gap junctions are a very important part of that process because they determine the connectivity of the network. They tell the network which which cell is, is connected to which other cell. So you spoke about the plan planarian. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you've also worked with other uh other kind of bodies. I think you've worked with frogs as well. What are the, how, how, how much has it scaled up and what does the future look like? Yeah, we've, we've worked with many different organisms. Uh, well, the frog model is one of, our, one of our favorites, but we also work with human uh, uh, cells and organoids in vitro. Um, we are now in mice in various, uh, various kinds of a project. So for example, one of the, one of the projects uh, that we've been working on is limb regeneration. And we've uh, developed a, uh, um, a set of interventions that trigger a, uh, a, limb, uh, a limb wound to regenerate the entire limb, let's say the hind limb, a leg. And so, so we've solved that in frog and we are now uh, attempting the same thing in mice. And the idea is to go for, ultimately to go for organ regeneration in humans. You said about like, you know, there's, there's this misconception that, you know, like cells die or like, you know, are they stop replicating the same manner and that's how we age. Uh, ha is there any proof of concept of it being replicated in the mice or the human cells that where we can say, you know, we are uh, moving towards a future where cancer wouldn't be an issue in, in the work that you do? Well, let me back up for a second. So, so what I specifically said about the, was the misconception is that there's a there's a there's a theory that aging is inevitable because errors accumulate, and uh, you know, there, I mean, obviously, with um, there is there is entropy, and eventually errors do accumulate. But what the planaria are telling us is that it's perfectly possible to be an extremely long-lived, uh, if not immortal, organism because they continuously regenerate the tissues that they lose to senescence. So uh, that kind of approach, uh, as far as aging, the, that kind of approach has not yet been demonstrated in, in, uh, in mammalian systems. Um, as far as cancer, we have shown that, uh, so, so let's just back up for a second. Um, our, our view of cancer is as a uh, disorder of multicellularity. And what I mean by that is, uh, we should think about we should we should think not about why is there cancer the right question is why isn't there just cancer all the time like why do cells ever build healthy organs instead of living uh, living for themselves and there are a set of uh, communication mechanisms that scale up 
the goals of individual cells into large scale anatomical set points like building organs and healthy organs and so on. And so sometimes that process breaks down and it breaks down when cells disconnect informationally, disconnect from the rest of the body, because at that point uh, they roll back to their unicellular tiny little goals, which is to proliferate and to migrate as much as they want. And that's metastasis. So what we've been working on is, first of all, detecting when that process is happening and second, reversing it by um, functionally reconnecting them to their uh, to, to their neighbors. So, so forcing them to be part of the electrical network. When you do that, uh, they 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 uh, they become part of this larger collective that works towards anatomical goals, and they don't defect and go off and and treat the rest of the body as just external environment, which is what cancer does. So so we've had we've had good success uh, suppressing and reversing that in the frog model. We are now in human glioblastoma cells, and hopefully someday in patients, but not yet. Uh, how does selection play a role in embryogenesis? So like evolutionary selection, you mean? Yes. Well, selection, um, uh, yeah, selection, of course, shapes uh, embryogenesis uh, by uh, having uh, having in, an impact on which, which functional forms get to reproduce. So if embryogenesis is such that it produces an adult that isn't competitive, it's going to get weeded out. Uh, if it produces a process that uh, doesn't solve problems, it's going to be weeded out as well. And what I mean by problems is that mm, embryogenesis is, uh, is, is reliable, but it's not hardwired. Evolution doesn't make specific solutions to specific problems. It actually makes problem solving machines. And uh, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, you know, if you in, in many kinds of embryos, if you cut the embryo in half, or the early on, you don't get two half embryo, two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. Uh, if you have a salamander and you increase, uh, greatly increase the amount of uh, d the copy number of the genome in the early uh, egg, you still get a normal, you, the cells become very large, you still get a normal salamander. And um, the, uh, the, the, the number of cells that participate in making the organs is reduced because the cells are larger. It's, all of that is automatic. In fact, if you make the cells really huge in cases like when they need to make a little tube that uh, goes to the kidneys, for example, instead of multiple cells working together to form this tube, one single giant cell will wrap around itself and still make the same structure. So, so th think about what this means. If you're, if you're a salamander embryo, you have to be able to develop in a way that you can't count on how many copies of your genome you have. You can't count on how, what your cell size is. You can't count on what your cell number is. You don't know any of those things. You have to be able to assemble a good uh, a good uh, embryo and ultimately a good adult, even if all kinds of things are changing. The, 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 the genetics are changing, the cell, uh, you know, the building blocks of your device are, are changing, the, uh, you might be injured, all kinds of things, and you still have to, have to make it. So, so that's, that's kind of the key thing about, about uh, evolution is that it doesn't just make something that works once and that's it. The, the magic of embryogenesis is not that you get from an egg to an adult. The magic is that despite all kinds of uh, unexpected activity along the way, it will still get its job done under many, many diverse circumstances. And how does this, like, you know, evolution and embryogenesis connect with artificial intelligence and building AI and robots where things are like, that? They're, they're, I, from my perspective, these worlds do merge. Not a lot of people believe that. And like, we will be half, like, you know, half AI, half human, and that's how our evolution is going to like move towards. What are your thoughts on that? How do these two worlds collide? Yeah, yeah, they, these worlds collide uh, very, very uh, fundamentally, which is what one of the one of the most um, important things that developmental biology teaches us is the right way to think about diverse intelligence. So people uh, argue about AI all the time, and uh, a common thing they think about is the human mind or the human brain. And they say, you know, these AIs are different. We're not machines, you know, all this kind of stuff. But if you track back from your current position as an adult human with, an, with a mature human mind, you will eventually end up with as, as a single cell unfertilized oocyte, which is a little blob of chemistry. And there is no magical moment during development where boom, now you went from being just a pile of chemistry, ah, now you have a true mind. Okay, there's no time where that happens. It's a continuous slow uh, progression. So it's very important for people who, um, who say that um, artificial intelligence is 
are in some way fundamentally, they, they have to be fundamentally different from, from our human intelligence to remind ourselves that we all, we all come from an amoeba, basically, right? We all come from single cell, um, single cell um, organisms. And so whatever, whatever, you, whatever you think the human mind is, you have to ask what capacities of the chemical physical system that was a single cell or a single oocyte, what capacities got you there? And there's absolutely no reason we can't recapitulate some of those capacities in other media in it, by using engineering. Um, and so, so the field of diverse intelligence, which looks at problem solving in slime molds and uh, amoebas and, and tissues and organs and um, you know, uh, all, all kinds of uh, unconventional media, uh, really is there to remind us that uh, intelligence is much broader than our typical human example. And so, and so uh, part, of, part of what this, this, this uh, field uh, is, is doing for us is letting us uh, broaden our ideas about what natural intelligence is, what artificial intelligence is, and how can we can work together. And uh, I 100% I believe that very much like, you know, primitive, primitive man uh, started using all kinds of tools to enhance their capacities, right? So, so, so sticks, and now we have glasses and uh, and iPhones, and you know, this is kind of the the extended mind uh, kind of work, right? From from Andy Clark and so on, and uh, we are going to have all kinds of smart prosthetics, and we're going to be uh, extending our our intelligence in many different ways and merging it with other intelligences that are not like ours. They they may be completely alien, uh, but uh, but we will be able to um, uh, expand our, our our potential using those technologies what's the current state of affairs now like i know there's a future about it but like how is the current work done towards ai and like you know mixing these two worlds and what does it look like right now what research is being done in this field yeah well there's a tremendous amount of research in this field so i'm certainly not going to be able to um, speak to everything but but some of the some of the exciting things first of all on the on the embodiment side is uh, there's some really great uh, things going on with respect to br um, brain and body computer interfaces. So the idea that, um, and this is this stems all the way back from the to the 60s and 70s work with um, sensory augmentation and sensory substitution. It started out with um, you, you know assistive devices for the blind and things like this that delivered visual information through the skin and other ways. But basically, basically, there's a lot of great um, work now uh, expa expanding the the sensors and effectors of the standard human body with various kinds of um, all the way from prosthetic limbs to, you know, you can start with a prosthetic limb and, and, and the brain can learn to use these various, um, various kinds of objects. And then, and then you might say that, well, instead of, uh, you know, instead of uh, vision in the three dimensional world, what I'd like to have is a sensor that senses sunspots, the movement of the solar market and uh, the stock market rather. And, um, you know, I don't know, uh, the, the, the magnetic field of the earth over the last month, maybe that, maybe those are the senses that you want. And so, and so we can, you can certainly have, you can certainly have that. So, and so there are people who are working on those interfaces. There is uh, the field of hybrids, which is brains, uh, cultured brains that control robotic bodies. So you can take a fish brain or a frog brain and, and connect it instead of driving a frog body, it'll drive a robot of some sort. And that robot might be a robot in the physical world and it might move around, or it might be a robot in some other space. It might be a robot in physiological space where it manages uh, some kind of industrial process or some kind of health, um, you know, some, some kind of health uh, adjustment uh, appliance or something like that. So those are the kinds of things that are going on um, sort of on the biotechnology side. And then, of course, uh, there's been there's been a huge advance in machine learning, um, you know, over the last uh, few years. Uh, it's extremely rapid progress in uh, making uh, different kinds of uh, systems that uh, are able to solve various kinds of problems for us. Uh, these things are are in no way a model of the human mind. They they are not uh, they're not the same as we are. But that doesn't mean they're not intelligent, and it doesn't mean that they don't um, have a utility. Or or in fact, on the other side, can cause can cause problems. You know, many things can cause problems even if they're not human or super intelligent or anything like that. So um, yeah, there's very uh, kind of very vibrant research done in all of these areas, and it's all it's all come, going to come together at some point. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in philosophy? Because I'm changing gears completely. But like all of this comes together to make uh, like, you know, to kind of reflect in the work that you do. So it kind of like, you know, the, these puzzles have to like merge. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all ev everything we do from from embodied robotics to cancer is all part of the same question, which is uh, I've been interested in this question since I was probably six or seven years old. Uh, and where it started was um, uh, when I was when I was very little. Uh, uh, I, I had asthma and uh, we didn't have any access to, to decent medication. And so uh, what my father used to do was take the back off of the TV set. We had this giant, like ancient uh, TV set that had vacuum tubes and whatever. And, uh, he, and he would take the back off of it and, and, and I would sit there and stare at it, you know, sort of as a distraction, uh, you know, kind of technique. And, uh, and, and that, that, was, uh, that was very fundamental for me because it was, it, you, you could see all the parts, right? And it was very obvious that somebody knew how to put all those parts together in the right way. Um, and, 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 and therefore, uh, you could learn to, to you know, that, that there wasn't just one person who knew how to do it. Apparently, you could learn to do that, right? And, um, and, uh, and, and, and so, so, so I was really, from the beginning, I was really in love with, with technology, with engineering, with electricity especially, and, and thinking about how you shape these, um, these parts in the right way to get the right thing to happen, right? So this kind of engineering. And at the same time, I had a friend, a slightly older older kid who was very interested in uh, insects and, and, and bugs and various things. And we would go outside and we would look at uh, caterpillars emerging from eggs and, uh, and, and beetles and worms and all of these things. And, you know, I would look at that and I would have all the exact same questions as like, okay, what are the parts? How do they come together? Who put them together? What's the, can we learn to put them together in a different way? What else can they do? I mean, you, you know, we would get these, um, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my, my, my parents would buy me this like uh, kit. It's a, you know, kind of an electronics thing where you, it's got these little parts and you can rearrange the parts and you can build different things. You can make a radio or a flashlight or something else, right? So you would look at the biologicals and you'd say, okay, well, so can we rearrange those parts and what can they do? And fundamentally, uh, the, animals that we were dealing with obviously had preferences. They had goals, they had preferences, they had behaviors. The TV didn't seem like it had preferences. It seemed like it was just doing what it does. And so what's the difference? What 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 exactly what's the what's the magic that makes the difference between between those classes of things? What's and what's in between and where uh where can it uh, where can it go what's the what's the limit of this so so i've been thinking about this stuff since i was very little and uh i've always wanted to um uh yeah always wanted to be a scientist and to be able to uh, uh try to answer some of these questions and to do experiments and, and create new things that didn't exist before uh have you heard of lee cronin's work um his work on creating life uh, from like non-living and so it's like they we still haven't found that bridge between like you know living and non-living and uh, do you think that when we do find that maybe we will be able to like merge the world of ai or like like you said like the tv versus a bug outside and that is when like things will completely like 10x itself um i i, I like lee's work very much okay i think what he does is really interesting um i have a slightly different view on this whole business which is that i don't believe that uh living and non-living are discrete categories. I don't believe that there is any such thing as uh, something that's, a, you know, um, a, a useful, clean category where we can say this is non this is the living, this is non-living. Uh, we're going to, you know, and these are essential categories and we need to merge them. I, I, I don't believe in any of that. I think that uh, living and non-living are not, um, to me, they're not uh, the most of, of important categories. To me, what's important is a spectrum of cognition. So I'm interested in a spectrum that uh, a smooth continuum that goes from extremely uh, passive um, uh, matter that basically just hold, you know, that does nothing on its own, and all the way on the other side of the spectrum is our uh, very um, uh, highly intelligent systems that uh, have meta meta goals and, and and these kinds of things, and then everything in between. So I'm interested in the transition uh, uh, across that across that spectrum. And I don't see any, because of that, I don't see any fundamental difference between uh, devices that solve problems that we would not call alive. I don't think we really have, and I know Lee's working on it, and so maybe he'll, he'll have a good criterion, but um, I, I don't know of any good, useful uh, uh, definition of that term that can be used again, you know, in, in, in everyday life, of course, you know, we know which things are, which things are living and which things are not living, but this is just a convenience. It's a social convenience. It's like the word adult, you know, there's nothing magic that happens to you on your 18th birthday. We just sort of use this category to make life go smoother. But I think it's one of these categories. Uh, there, there's a, there's a very exciting field of uh, active matter, which shows how, uh, very, very simple, minimal systems 
can do interesting uh, cognitive proto cognitive tasks. And um, I think the important thing they and, 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 you know, people often look at that and they say, well, that's just physics. R right. So simple is systems that are minimal enough where you can actually see how they work. You can call that physics, but so are we. We are we are physics, too. And you can't um, make distinctions based on whether it's obvious or not how something works. That that a lot of the times, as, you know, as soon as you've explained something, you say, ah, well, then, you know, then that's not so great. This mm -hmm. happens in artificial intelligence all the time. It's moving the goalposts. As soon as you achieve something, you say, well, that couldn't have been it. The, the, that there's no magic there. That couldn't have been it. And so, so I, I don't believe there's any magic of that kind to be found. And uh, I think there's a very smooth continuum between systems that are that are very simple and very complex and everything in between do you think maybe it is the case that like we are just a collection of simple systems and that's why we seem complex but we are not because it's just that we've evolved so much with so many systems all together and that is how we're defining living versus non-living i mean well a few things uh it's, inev it's inevitable that we are a collection of simpler systems. That's true. There's no getting around that. Uh, all intelligence is collective intelligence. There's no such thing as some kind of indivisible diamond of intelligence that isn't made of parts. Everything is made of parts. Now, mm -hmm. it so happens that today there is a, there is a major difference between um, evolved systems and the kinds of systems that we typically engineer, but that's, that, that's a limitation that's going to be overcome fairly soon. The limitation is that um, biological systems are very deeply multi-scale. So at every level, so from, from, the, from the group to the individual, to the t organs, the tissues, the cells, and the individual molecular networks, every layer in that system has a c competency. Every level in that system is solving some kind of problem. That's a very unique multi-scale competency architecture. Typically speaking, our current engineering devices don't do that. So I give a talk sometimes called Why Robots Don't Get Cancer. And the reason robots don't get cancer is because at the moment they're not made of active parts. Their parts don't don't want to do anything. The the individual system might, but but the parts are pretty dumb. And so there's one layer. Typically, there's one layer of intelligence in these systems. But it doesn't have to be that way. That's just how we started out. And uh, people in the artificial life community, in the robotics communities, and so on, are of course working on this. And we are going to have multi-scale architectured machines. And then, then they will have many of the same properties that we currently associate with life. There's nothing magic about protoplasm. <clears throat> There's nothing really magic about evolution either. You know, evolution as, as this kind of, um, as, as typically envisioned, and I'm not saying that's actually what it is. I think uh, there's issues with that. But, but, but this kind of, um, uh, kind of blind search driven by selection that people normally think about as evolution, that doesn't have any monopoly on making minds. We can make minds using directed engineering as well. Why would it have to be a blind search that creates that? So, so I, I don't actually think there's any profound distinction between living and non-living things, except that we call life the things that are very good at scaling up across uh, levels of organization. The things that are very good at it, we call that life. And someday we will be making objects that are also very good at it. We haven't yet, but we will. Going back to the talk that you gave about why robots don't get cancer. Uh, and you said like like certain there each part doesn't have less like does not have a specific set goals doesn't have like things that it wants to do. Uh, how did we make that differentiation with humans? Because we would assume that each part has its set of goals. Like you know each like you know in my skin is supposed to protect my body. It's the the barrier between uh, like you know the external versus the internal. It doesn't want to do anything else. Like how did we come to that conclusion? So that's so that's actually that's 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 a that's an interesting uh, comparison um which I can talk about. Um, first, first of all, let's let's agree on on what goals are. So goals are not magic. Goals are also not necessarily a second order metacognitive goals. You don't have to know you have goals to have goals. Your thermostat has a goal. The goal is to keep your temperature of the, your house at a certain range, right? So, so ever since cybernetics and control theory, we've had a good rigorous science of what goals are. It used to be magic. It doesn't have to be magic anymore. So um, now the question is, what what are the biological goals? So. Let's look at uh, let's look at the skin. In fact, um, so if you look at a, at a frog embryo, frog embryo has skin, and you might and, and it's very reliable that uh, from a frog egg you always get frog skin that has a certain behavior. It has a actually a pretty boring lifestyle. It it sits uh, quietly as this kind of like 
two-dimensional surface on the outside of the embryo and it keeps out the bacteria. And you might say that, okay, that's what, that's what these skin cells know how to do. But the important thing about um, this kind of uh, studying basal cognition or diverse intelligence is that you can't make these decisions by pure observation. Pure observation doesn't tell you what's going on. You have to do experiments. If you do experiments, you can do something that uh, we did uh, a few years ago. This was all the biology was done by Doug Blackiston in my lab. And this is a project together with uh, Josh Bongard, who's a computer scientist, and uh, his uh, former student, Sam Kriegman. Uh, what we did was we segregated those cells away from the early embryo, and we basically gave them a chance to reboot their multicellularity. We said, okay, if these other cells weren't telling you what to do, what would you do on your own? Now, they could have done many things. They could have done nothing. They could have died. They could have crawled away from each other. They could have made a flat um, cell layer like in uh, tissue culture. Instead, what they do is they combine together into a round little, uh, little um, uh, uh, we call it a biobot because it's a biorobotics platform. And we call these things xenobots because the xenopus lavis is the name of the frog. And what it does is it, uh, it, it forms a completely different type of creature. So it has spontaneous motion. It uses little hairs to swim or to, to push against water and swim around. Uh, it, it has individual behaviors. It has collective behaviors. Um, it actually can make copies of itself by running around and collecting loose skin cells and putting them into a ball that makes the next generation of xenobots. No other creature to, to our knowledge on earth does that. It's called kinematic self-replication. So it has, and, and there are many other things I can't talk about yet because it's not published and peer reviewed. So it has all these behaviors that um, would be completely not obvious from looking at a piece of skin. It's they're quite different. And so those are actually the default behavior of these cells. That what you see in the, in the context of the embryo is what they've been basically behavior shaped into doing by the other cells. So it's the part of the, as part of the collective, they're forced to do certain things. That isn't actually what, and, and if you separate the cells, none of that is what they want to be doing. The individual cells wanted to be, be doing something completely different. Uh, so it's, it's really important to be able to do, do experiments and find out under different conditions, what is the, uh, kind of uh, stable behavior, and and the 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 way the way of course you find out what level of competency they have towards specific goals is to deviate them from that goal and see what happens. So this is a nice analogy that um, somebody used at one point. I don't remember who it was, but he said that it's it's the it's the spectrum between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together, right? The difference is that the magnets have a very minimal competency. All they know how to do is minimize distance to, to reduce the free energy. So they just, they're just trying to come together. If there's a barrier, they will stand there pressed up against the barrier. They're never going to go around the barrier, right? It's not, not that kind of system. Romeo and Juliet have a, you know huge capacity for going around all kinds of physical and social systems to get what they want. And in between you have simple, you know, you have rumbas and paramecia and you know all kinds of different creatures that have different degrees of competency to get their goals met despite various difficulties. So, okay, what is reality and how does that like, you know, in plain terms of your work? Uh, it's a small question. Yeah, we're, we're, we're now doing questions, <laughs> I see. Um, okay, and, and um, well, look, uh, you, you know, you, you could ask uh, Don Hoffman or people like that. Um, w w the way I think about it is that uh, reality is uh, an observer dependent model that tries to predict your next experience. So it's basically reality is the model that each of us and each of our cells and each of our organs and many other things uh, are all creating and updating at all times to kind of make sense of what's happened before and extract rules that help you predict what's going to happen next. And in particular, predict your own next uh, perceptions. So this is a version. It's a version of perceptual control theory. It's a, nowadays it's it's kind of called active inference. Um, that that I think is is what reality is. It's a, it's a, it's an observer's perspective on their experience. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the conversation.